Our next speaker is uh, Professor Snow Barlow. Snow is a plant physiologist and agricultural scientist whose research encompasses water plant use efficiency, viticulture and impacts of climate change on agriculture, water management and global food security. He is currently Foundation Professor of Horticulture and Viticulture at the University of Melbourne. Snow chairs the expert assessment panel of the Department of Agriculture, Fishery and Forestry's Climate Change R&D program, convenes the Primary Industries Research Adaption Network of the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility and is a member of the Minister's NGO Roundtable on Climate Change and Land Sector Group. Together with his past partner, Winston, he operates a commercial farm. Snow. Um, well, um, I don't know whether it's a good or a bad thing uh, to do the after lunch session, which is always the, the graveyard session. And then uh, the second thing, of course, is uh, talking after Mick Keogh is, is always a challenge uh, because uh, Mick always gives you some great and detailed um, information. And uh, I think what you've heard was a terrific uh, expose in what the carbon tax legislation is about, what it attempts to do, and then some great, uh, you know, worked examples of, of where it might be going in the systems you want. Knowing that Mick was going to talk to me, uh, talk before me, and also with the challenge that Lachlan gave me uh, to talk about, you know, would farmers be, be paid for environmental services and a couple of other things, and then the question really was, what elements should farmers now be thinking of uh, with regard to environmental services in modern farm management? Uh, it's a bit challenging. So what I decided to do was to talk, talk about some ideas with you. Many of you are familiar with uh, the whole concept of environmental services. Uh, environmental services is, is really about uh, monetarising this. It's probably not a proper word in the Oxford Dictionary, but it now has a parlance of monetarising things. So how do you... Uh, and the three elements of the environment that are always talked about in terms of environmental services are water, carbon and biodiversity. Uh, as you all know, and particularly where you sit here right beside the Murray, uh, there has been a price on water uh, now for almost 20 years. Uh, for, since the uh, original Murray-Darling cap in 1993, uh, water trading fundamentally began, and actually probably before that. We now will have a price on carbon in, on the 1st of July, as Mick talked about. So that leaves only biodiversity where we don't really have a price yet and indeed biodiversity has always been acknowledged as it's always going to be the difficult one and uh, I think it might be a while before um, we have a price on biodiversity. So what I want to talk to you about today is how you regard environmental services in running your farm. Uh, do you regard environmental services and the fact that they're beginning to be monetarised as an alternative enterprise on your farm? Or do you integrate environmental services into the business of your farm as a productive farm? Uh, I say this because uh, how you approach, and as Mick just told you uh, how you approach soil carbon, how you approach plantation forestry, uh, and how you approach decreasing emissions, whether it be from animals, uh, whether it be methane from waste uh, anaerobic ponds, uh, will depend in a bit in your philosophy approaching those things. And it also will depend, I hope I can make this go forward, yeah. Uh, it depends a bit on whether you expect the government to pay you for environmental services or whether you expect ultimately the market will pay you for environmental services. So whether you'll go to the market as indeed uh, will people will be on carbon um, after the 1st of 
uh, 1st of July. And the second thing uh, which I'm going to argue today is that how we go here will depend on our imagination and your imagination and our innovation because I think the game is going to change but it always depends on how you approach that game. So to put a bit of formalisation in, in what I was just talking about, uh, the Carbon Farming Initiative, which became law and provides, as Mick said, this ACUS, the Australian Carbon Credit Unit, uh, has led us to believe that we can therefore have a prof... When we look at a profitable and sustainable farm, uh, we might have a farm productivity angle and we might have an environmental service angle and some of those environmental services such as carbon and perhaps water if you're in that business uh, might uh, contribute to productivity and perhaps biodiversity would be part of sustainability but not monetarised. What that means is, um, and I guess many of you do this at present, but you are essentially running sort of two agendas on the farm rather than one agenda. So what I want to argue today is let's just take time for a while and think about if you merge those agendas. Uh, sustainability is always in that equation, uh, but profitability is also in that equation. And you began to think of in a carbon farming initiative world where we, we have... Uh, provided units which are saleable, um, how you can incorporate that into your farming operations and what the emphasis is in the farming operations, whether those emphasis in the farming operation is indeed on what you might call traditional but are very much evolving products, whether they be beef, wool, uh, wheat, uh, milk, whatever, uh, but farm, in my case, grapes, uh, or whether you regard them that you're looking for a, a separate and a substantive income through environmental services. And to look at that, I just want to take you, uh, and it's not dispelled myths, but a, a different way of looking at things. This is a global carbon cycle. Um, and uh, luckily Mick did a great job of explaining this. This is in... Uh, billions of tonnes of carbon rather than carbon dioxide. Uh, so if you want to convert those figures to carbon dioxide, just multiply them by 3.67. Uh, but they're all in carbon. And what you see there is that 750 billion tonnes of carbon that sits up there in the atmosphere is probably the smallest pool on the globe, probably just a bit bigger than the plant pool, if you see on your left, the green part, smaller than soil, much smaller than fossil fuels, and much, much smaller than what's in the oceans. So when we talk about decarbonising the world, when we talk about carbon-constrained economies, we're not really talking about taking carbon away. Carbon is the central thing to everything we do. The first thing a plant does is grabs carbon and makes some other compounds, whether that be sugars or proteins or whatever. Uh, so it's really what we're talking about is energy, not carbon. And that's the very important thing to think about. And so if you look here, uh, in those, those arrows obviously indicate the fluxes that go up and down. In red is what we call the anthropomorphic or where we intervene in the global carbon cycle. So fundamentally what happens is, uh, and it may be slightly different, this is about two or three years old, these figures, but they're pretty much right. There's about six and a half billion tonnes of carbon that are burned in fossil fuels each year and go into the atmosphere. There's another, some like 1.5, 1.6 billion that come from land clearing and burning biological waste, effectively. That gives you eight-plus billion tonnes in the atmosphere. What you end up with 3.3 of those billion tonnes end up up there as CO2, and that's what gives us the increased greenhouse effect. Another, uh, fundamentally, uh, 
a certain amount comes back, which we'll get in this bottom, another 4.6 actually comes back from that atmosphere into the ocean by chemical absorption or into the vegetation by accelerated growth due to higher CO2. So what, but the other thing you've got to look at there is every year not 8 billion tonnes was what, what we as humans are, are putting up and down. There are actually more than 60 billion tonnes that go up and down from the plant-based sink. So in other words, plants on the globe pluck out more than 60 billion tonnes of carbon out of the atmosphere each year and put it into the vegetation and but roughly about the same amount goes back up whether it goes through us or animals and gets liberated as CO2 or whether it sits on the ground and decays. So that's the carbon cycle. So what I'm trying to concentrate you on now is maybe it's a smarter thing <laughs> to look at that 60 billion tonnes without necessarily just concentrating what we see as those 3 billion tonnes in the atmosphere. And that's sort of really the basis of this. So how do we bring the environmental services and farm productivity uh, agendas together? And when we think of this, uh, it's always good to think of what the fundamentally sort of tensions and drivers on the globe at present, and I'm sure you've had plenty of talks about this, but I'll run very quickly through this. But it's important. And of course, the fundamental driver on the globe is really food for sustenance. We, go, we just reached a 7 billion people world. We're going towards a 9 or 10 billion people world in 40 years. Uh, so the demand of food is a given, but increasing, and it depends on how much you think, whether it's going to be 40 or 50% more. Because the demand for food isn't a linear process, it doesn't equal just population, it equals population times what you eat. And what you saw is that as people become more wealthy, they tend to what? Eat more animal protein, and therefore that requires more fodder with a lower conversion rate than just eating carbohydrate from cereals. So many of you might have seen the Age articles uh, last week, but, and you would have been, as I was, astounded to see that basically China now consumes more than 25% of the global meat production and rising. And it is in absolute terms above American consumption, not there, of course, in per capita, but it's on a very sharp turn. So that's a strong demand before India clicks in or other Asian economies click in. The second thing we've got to notice and, and be aware of, it's not carbon, it's energy. Uh, energy demand is the other thing that drives the globe. Uh, all developed economies have essentially got where they've got by burning energy in industrial processes. And so what we have on the globe is a demand for energy that goes up probably by 1.5%, 2% a year. Uh, it was sort of interesting that it, it flatlined or decreased just a little during the global financial crisis. And last year it compensated and went up 6% uh, as we supposedly came out. The second thing um, is uh, that there's not only energy uh, demand from the population, there's also demand from farmland, which you're very aware of. And that demand from farmland is about biofuels, where nations try to protect their sovereignty by producing their own liquid fuels. Um, and America's doing that. Europe is doing that at present. And, of course, uh, the demand for forest and forest products also intervenes for food. Water and carbon, which we've monetarised in our economy, are really the currency of those things, uh, but in some ways they're not the drivers. So what we really need, um, the water and the carbon aren't the, com aren't the commodities in demand. The commodity in demand are the food and the energy. So 
Climate change um, is a product of that demand for energy, not an overindulgence of carbon. And in doing that, and I want to now try and introduce you to, to an, another co concept, which is about the price of carbon. Uh, Mick and many of the economists have speculated that the price of carbon is going to increase quite rapidly. Quite rapidly. But yet, uh, and Mick would be the first to agree in this, that if you look at the European market, that really hasn't happened quite before the current financial crisis in Europe. This is what's called a cost abatement curve uh, prepared originally by McKinsey's and this has been modified for Australian conditions. And when you look at that, anything below the line uh, indicates that you can apply new technology apply to decrease your carbon emissions and you're fundamentally going to make money out of it. So you're in the black when you're below the line. It's a bit silly, but that's the way they do this curve. When you're above the line, uh, you are in the red, which means anything you do to pull carbon out of the atmosphere or decrease emissions is going to cost you money. And the reason why we have a carbon farming initiative, the reason why we have bipartisan support for carbon, if you look at the green dots uh, just above the line, they're all the land-based sector measures where you can buy mitigation of emissions the cheapest. So that's why people look to soil carbon. That's why people look to plantation forestry. That's why people look to these land-based things rather than when you get over on the side, uh, the right-hand side, the, the, the grey side, and you start look at, looking at photovoltaic energy, wind energy, these mechanical solutions to create energy. So. Uh, one of the things that indeed has happened in California is you put a price in carbon uh, and people take the options on the left. So the fact that the carbon price is not going up because we all like to think you know, commodities go up. But I think it's quite good if, if the carbon commodity doesn't go up because it indicates that people are harvesting low-hanging fruit. They can achieve uh, mitigation by either changing, uh, in this case, a lot of that around the side is old air conditioners, old air conditioning systems, all those sort of dirty technology that there's much better technology available now. So I think, while people think 23 bucks a tonne is going to accelerate uh, through to 40 bucks a tonne very quickly after 2015, I would bet you a good bottle of wine it won't. <laughs> because I'll bet you that uh, when it comes in, people will find that you can decrease your energy usage uh, in ways that don't really affect your lifestyle. So that's the first uh, driver that I see there. The second one is, like it or not, mitigation still will be important to the globe. This is a diagram which I obviously like, um, but it's where we're going unless we don't do anything about uh, emissions on the globe with a global agreement. Uh, it's good to think of it in terms of generations and then I've taken the liberty of putting Winsome and I there where we might and we'll be probably okay because we're probably only going to see one degree. Uh, our kids are probably going to see two degrees and our grandkids, of which we've got ten of them, uh, are going to see three to four degrees. That's when going to be the pressure that will keep coming in terms of having to do something about climate change. If you think of your grandkids, you want to do something about it. And that's that yellow uh, area where we have to decrease emissions. The other tension which is very important in our area here is agriculture and the production of food, and we said food was one of the major drivers, is also a large emission of greenhouse gases. And while uh, under the current carbon tax arrangement, agriculture is not a covered entry and hasn't any commitments, and the CFI provides a way for agriculture to develop offsets without commitment. As we go forward on a 
you know, an intergenerational level, uh, you know, I'm talking 20, 30 years, and we do sop up uh, a lot of the energy efficiency in the globe, even go away from coal to gas and maybe to photovoltaic in terms of, um, and solar in other ways, in energy production, food is going to begin to stand out as a big emitter. If you look at that diagram at present, you'll see if you put agriculture and land use change and forestry together, you get something that is almost 30%, and this is a global figure, but Australia's own figures aren't very different from this. And if you cut down that power generation, uh, say, to take it down to 10%, and if you take transportation with biofuels down to something that is half that, suddenly agriculture expands to something that is like 50% of the emissions very quickly. Uh, so one of the inevitabilities for me and why I, I'm saying this is if you're planning your future farming systems that you have to begin to think of not necessarily cutting your total emissions because that's going to be very difficult globally in agriculture and food production. You need to think in terms of cutting the greenhouse gas intensity of the products you produce. In other words, and there's two ways of doing that, uh, and both you can do both. You can either cut the emissions you make or you can produce more the productivity agenda for the same amount of greenhouse gas. And either way, you're going to less end up with a lower greenhouse gas intensity of whatever you produce. So let's look about go back to try, you know, how we might monetize the farm. Um, so really what I'm saying, in doing that, is it better to concentrate on carbon credits or is it better to concentrate on productivity with sustainability and because are we making then a bet that the price of food might go up more in the long term than the price of carbon credits. Quite apart from where it stands and as Mick, Mick said at, at present. The other thing of course is uh, the questions of change of the sovereign risk, the question of change of government. You know, do we attempt to extract social, pa social payments, which that's what environmental services from government are, uh, for maintaining uh, natural resources. This has been an argument that's been there for a very long time and few companies are doing it. Uh, but it may be that the environmental services eventually become part of the price of the products you sell. Now, people have tried that and people are getting some, you know, some premiums for biological farm milk and that. But in general, the organic premiums and the, the environmental premiums and the environmental branded products are relatively small to date, uh, but they're nonetheless there. So in practice, would it mean we were concentrating on food and converting waste to uh, combine carbon into energy? Why don't you, I want to take you to an example to get you thinking about this. Uh, this is a map uh, net, mapping what we call net primary productivity, and that is the amount of carbon the plants in any one place in eastern Australia pull down, less the amount of carbon they respire each year. So it's the net amount of carbon that comes down. Uh, don't worry about the figures there, because I'm going to go show you something that you can probably understand a bit better. Uh, it depends, obviously, on soils and rainfall, uh, give or take vegetation type a bit. But if you look at that, you can see if you're in 400 mils, uh, you might you know, come up at two and a half, uh, you know, basically a year. Dry matter production about five, and then an abatement potential of maybe nine tonnes of CO2. These, the others are on carbon. And if you're in 800, you'll get to 15 tonnes of dry matter per hectare, and 20, as Mick said, about 25 tonnes per uh, uh, CO2. That's assuming you could harvest at all. But just think about it. In your own production systems, on 15 tonnes of dry matter per year, 
how much, uh, if you're able to use it all, how much milk you'd, could you produce and what would be the gross margin on that? If you thought of it as meat, uh, you know, there is a harvest, there's obviously a grazing efficiency, uh, you know, uh, industry that you've got to put in there, but how much meat can you produce on that? And how much wheat could you produce in a, in a cropping situation? And even more, how much do you have to bet that the 23 tonnes that will start uh, are going to go up rather than go down uh, in terms of if you were looking to harvest 27 tonnes, and it's probably about half that. So you have to ask that, which will give you the better return? So in looking forward to the sort of things that, you know, I think we should be thinking about on farms is how we bring those together. Mick indicated in his talk, which is a great introduction, in a sense of, uh, in terms of the risk to your enterprises, the better bets are reducing emissions rather than going for sequestration into soil or perhaps environmental plantings. You know, that's a different thing you're making. You're doing that for other purposes. Saw logs, again, is different. But if you think of just soil, there are risks there. But if you think of improving the emissions intensity of uh, the products you produce in terms of methane, in terms of uh, nitrous oxide as well, because when you start focusing on nitrous oxide, it's not so much the emissions of nitrous oxide, it's whether you can get greater nitrogen use efficiency out of the system that you're using. And uh, many years ago when I started out in this game, I worked on nitrogen for a while and I've come back to nitrogen quite recently and I'm still amazed that we as agriculturalists apply nitrogen and basically people don't do much better than 60% recovery efficiency from applied nitrogen. There's a lot to work on there. Uh, secondly, how much of that, if we say the 15 tonnes of dry matter, do you actually use or how much do you throw away? You know, the plant went to a lot of trouble fixing that, that carbon. Uh, how much do you use in your system? Should we not be thinking about not throwing away that other, whether it be methane into a methane anaerobic pond, whether it be uh, even harvested wood products, why couldn't we convert that into energy and begin to pay some of our energy bills? Because what we, you know, the first thing that's going to hit us all is we've seen a 30% increase in the price of electricity even before the carbon tax. We'll probably get 10% when the carbon tax comes in. So. I think we're throwing away a lot of energy that we've expended fertiliser to fix from the atmosphere and we haven't quite found a way to utilise that. We've utilised some well in food products but then... And then uh, you can focus activities on sequestration but that could be around water quality, environmental plantings. Uh, it could be around uh, other areas as well. So I'm not saying don't do that but I'm just saying keep it mainstream. And finally, I want to just end up with, you know, I've been advocating looking at these areas that, um, where we reduce emissions rather than sequest. The first one is uh, nitrous oxide. Uh, if you look, the, the, there is almost a methodology ready now on nitrous oxide that will be applicable uh, in the carbon farming initiative. Uh, that's largely around the use of inhibitors. Um, you can, if you have to maintain your emissions at the same point under the CFI, you're supposed to do that. You know, there's not, you're not statutorily bound to that, but in terms of if you had to pay for your quota, that's where you would be. So you can reduce both the nitrogen you use, but if you went the other way in, in the emissions intensity argument, you might be able to increase productivity and also decrease the emissions intensity. And a, a figure Richard Eckhart gives me is that to use the nitrification and urease inhibitors on farm, you'd have to, to get your money back from the CFI, you'd have to have a carbon price of 800 bucks. 
But all you need to produce, if you use the same amount of nitrogen with greater efficiency, is another 500 kilograms of dry matter per year uh, to get yourself into the back of the cost. So to me, that puts it in, in context, and there's a couple of slides here. We go next to methane, similar sort of things about what you... This is meant to come in there, yeah. What you might do, and this is about, and Mick mentioned about oils, uh, there's a whole bunch of technologies coming through to decrease emissions uh, intensity of methane. Some are around genetics, some are around management, some are around supplements, and there's others as well. And just the reality check on that is, you know, a New South Wales example, if you turn off earlier, if you manage better change, you can perhaps, where you might get a 20% uh, less cows in crossbreeding, uh, profits might be 750 per farm from your bottom line, 700 bucks from uh, the CFI. Similarly, a northern beef example, uh, we were just using this lately, 25% improved reading rate through better management. Uh, a CFO income, you know, you, you might have a fair few hectares, but we're not talking about millions here. Uh, a small amount per hectare, but per farm, it could be 15 to 60 grand uh, in terms of your increased returns because you get greater productivity for increased uh, uh, shorter time to weaning. So, what I'm illustrating is the CFI, and this is important, but it needs to be with a productivity agenda because I think that will, one, take us in the right direction, but it'll also give us greater profitability uh, in the short term and in the long term. Uh, talking about these technologies uh, is not uh, me as an academic just plucking them out of the air saying, well, there'd be nice things if we did. There is a concentrated research program actually addressing those things that uh, the minister just announced, 70 million uh, that goes to the filling the research gap, which is looking those technologies around three major things, decreasing methane, decreasing nitrous oxide and improving nitrogen efficiency, soil carbon. And that's uh, a demonstration on the ground as well as research. And finally, uh, I think uh, what I've been trying to introduce the thoughts today is that we should try to put together that uh, sustainability agenda, environmental services agenda, to make it synergistic with the productivity agenda because that's where the outcomes are and that's where the financial outcomes will be. You need to think uh, within that framework uh, about the products and services that will create most value in the long term. And, you know, at this point, my money's on food. We also need to develop new production systems that uh, are sustainable but op optimise the full amount that you produced with that basic uh, photosynthesis of either the pastures, the crops or the trees or the, or the vines that you grow. And inevitably... If we all think about this agenda, you know, there are the researchers there, there are the people uh, such as the cats and men, but then there are you and I as farmers. Uh, a lot of innovation happens on the ground and it will not be the same solution for everyone in the same region. It will not be the same solutions in different regions. But it will be people will develop solutions if they have access to the technology, if their mind's in the right place, that can produce outcomes that I think will be not only sustainable, making use of where we have monetarised water and carbon, and perhaps biodiversity in the future, but having it on that strong productivity base that produces food. Thanks.